thank you everyone for coming. Um, if you were expecting the Postgres talk, that was the one before, so you might need to watch the video stream. Yes, um, so uh, Ansible best practices. I thought about calling it Ansible my best practices. So uh, just warning ahead, this is things I stumbled on uh, using Ansible for the last two, three years. And uh, those are like very specific things I found that work very well for me. Yeah, um, about me, um, I do also freelance work, uh, do a lot of Ansible in there. I'm also the Debian maintainer for Ansible with uh, Harlan Lieberman. So um, yeah, if there are any bugs in the package, you know, just report them. <coughs> Yes, um, so the um, talk will be roughly divided into four parts. Um, the first part will be about why you actually want to use config management and why you specifically want to use Ansible. So if you're still SSHing into machines and editing config files, you're probably a good candidate for using Ansible. Um, then uh, the second part will be about good role and playbook patterns that I have found that work really well for me. And the third chapter will be about um, typical anti-patterns I've stumbled upon, either in my work with other people uh, using Ansible or over the ISC support channel, for example. And uh, the fourth part will be um, like advanced tips and tricks you can use, uh, like fun things you can do with Ansible. So uh, quick elevator pitch, what makes config management good? Um, it actually also serves as a documentation of changes on your servers over time. So if you just put the whole config management in a Git repo and just regularly commit, you will actually be able to say, hmm, why doesn't this work? It used to work a year ago. You can actually um, check why. Um, also, uh, most um, config management tools have a lot better error reporting than your self-written bash scripts that do whatever. Um, and usually, you have um, a very good reproducibility with uh, config management and also idem potency, meaning that uh, if you run, for example, the playbook several times, you will always get the same result. Um, also, it's great if you work in a small team or you have you admin main time in the company and you have some people working on a few things too. Um, it makes teamwork a lot of easier. And you will save a lot of time actually debugging things when things break, in my opinion. So what makes Ansible good? Uh, comparing it to Chef or Puppet, for example, it's really easy to set up. You uh, start with two config files, you have it installed, and you're ready to go. Um, it's also agentless, so whatever machines you actually want to control, the only thing they really need to have is uh, an SSH daemon and Python 2.6 or upwards. So that's virtually any Debian machine you have installed and that is still supported in any way. Um, Ansible also supports uh, configuration of very many things like networking equipment or even Windows machines. They don't need SSH, but they use the um, WinRM. Um, but Ansible isn't came a bit late to the game, so Ansible's still not as good in coverage like, for example, Puppet, which literally you can configure any machine on the planet with that, as long as it has a CPU. Um, yeah, next up, I will talk about good role patterns. So, um, if you've never worked with Ansible before, this is the point when you watch the video stream that you pause it and start working a few weeks with it 
and then unpause the actual video. Um, so um, a good role should ideally have uh, the following layout. So in the role directory, you have the name of the role and the tasks a main YAML. Uh, you have the following rough layout. Um, you at the beginning of the pl uh, role, you check for various conditions. Uh, for example, using the assert task to, for example, check that certain variables are defined, things are set, that it's maybe part of a group, things like that you actually want to check. And then usually you install packages, you can use uh, apt or on CentOS machines, uh, yum, or you can do a git checkout or whatever. Um, then usually you do some templating of files where you have certain abstraction and the variables are actually put into the template and make the actual config file. Uh, there's also good to point out that the template module actually has um, a validate parameter. That means you can actually use a command to check your config file for syntax errors, and if that fails, uh, your playbook will fail before actually deploying that config file. So you can, for example, uh, use uh, Apache with uh, the right parameters to actually do a, con uh, a check on the syntax of the file. So that way you never end up with a state where there's a broken config or something there. Uh, and in the end, you usually, uh, when you change things, you trigger handlers to restart any demons. Um, if you use um, variables, I recommend putting sensible defaults in defaults uh, main YAML. And then you only have to override those variables on specific cases. So ideally you should have like sensible defaults you want to have to get whatever thing there is you want to have running. Um, when you start working with it um, and do that a bit more, you notice um, a few things and that is your role should ideally run in check mode. Ansible Playbook has a minus minus check that basically is just a dry run of your um, complete playbook. And with minus minus diff, it will actually show you, for example, file changes or, or file mode changes, stuff like that, and won't actually change anything. So if you end up editing a lot of stuff, you can use that as um, um, a check. And I'll later get to some anti-patterns that actually break that thing. So, um, yeah. And ideally, the way you change files and config and state, um, you should make sure that when the actual changes are deployed and you run it a second time, that um, Ansible doesn't report any changes. Because if you end up writing your roles fairly sloppy, you end up having a lot of changes, and then in the end of the report, you have like 20 changes reported, and you kind of then know, oh, those 18, they're always there, and you kind of miss the two that are important that actually broke your system. So if you want to do it really well, uh, you make sure that it doesn't report any changes when you run it twice in a row. Um, also a thing to um, consider is you can define variables in the defaults um, folder and also in the vars folder. But if you look up how uh, variables get inherited, you'll notice that the vars folder is really hard to actually override. So you want to avoid that as much as possible. Um, yeah, the much larger section will be about uh, typical anti-patterns I've noticed. 
and I'll uh, come to the first one now, is um, the shell or command module. Uh, when people start using Ansible, that's like the first thing they go is like, oh, well, I, um, I know how to use wget or I know apt-get install, and then they end up using the shell module to do the, just that. If you use the shell module or the command module, you usually don't want to use that. And that's for several reasons. Um, there's currently, I think, 1,300 different modules in Ansible. So there's likely a big chance that whatever you want to do, there's already a module for that that just, just does that thing. But um, those two modules also have uh, several problems. And that is um, the shell module, of course, gets uh, interpreted by your actual shell. So if you have any special variables in there, uh, you'd actually also have to take care of any variables you uh, interpret in the shell string. Um, then one of the biggest problems is if you run your uh, playbook in check mode, uh, the shell and the command module won't get run. So if you're actually doing anything with that, they just get skipped. And that might not, uh, that will cause that um, your actual check mode and sort of the real mode, um, they all start diverging if you use a lot of shell module. And um, the worst, also a bad part about this is that uh, those two modules, they'll always report back changed. Like you run a command and it exits zero, it's like, oh, it's changed. And uh, so to get the reporting right on that module, you'd actually have to define for yourself when this is actually a change or not. So you'd have to probably get the output and then uh, check, for example, if uh, there's something on standard error or something to report an actual error or change. Um, then I'll get to the actual examples. Uh, on the left is a bad example for um, using the shell module. I've seen that a lot. It's basically, oh, um, yeah, I actually want this file, so I'll just use cat path to file. Uh, and I'll use the register parameter to get the output. This is, uh, wait, do you see anything? It's here. So the actual output goes into the shell command. And then we want to copy it to some other file uh, somewhere else. And so we use the ginger uh, double squirrely brackets to uh, define the actual content of the file and then um, put it into that destination file. And that is problematic because, well, first of all, um, if you run it in check mode, this gets skipped. And then this variable is undefined and it will Ansible will fail with an error. So you won't be able to actually run that in check mode. And uh, the other problem is this will always report back changed. So um, you'd probably have to, uh, the most sensible thing would probably be to say just changed when false and just acknowledge that that shell command won't change anything on your system. So uh, the good example would be um, to use the actual slope mo module that will just slurp the whole file in Base64 encode it. And you can access um, the actual content with uh, pathfile.contents. Uh, and you then just Base64 decode it and write it in there. And the nice thing is um, slurp will never return any uh, change. So it won't say it changed. And it also works great in, um, in check mode. Um, here's another quick example. Um, the example on the left, oh yeah, wget. Um, here's the problem is uh, every time your playbook runs, <laughs> this file will get downloaded. And of course, if um, 
the file is uh, can't be retrieved from that URL, it'll throw an error, and uh, that will happen all the time. And uh, the right example is a more cleaner example using the uh, URI module. Uh, you define a URL to retrieve a file from. Uh, you define where you want to write it to, and you use the creates uh, parameter to say, well, uh, just skip the whole thing if the file's already there. Set facts. That's my uh, that's my pet peeve. Um, set facts is a module that allows you to define variables uh, during uh, your playbook run. So you can say set facts, and then this variable uh, equals uh, that variable plus the third variable, or whatever. You can do things with that. Um, it's very problematic, though, because you end up having your variables change during the playbook run. And that is um, a problem when you use the minus minus start at um, parameter from Ansible Playbook. And um, because if you, uh, this, this parameter allows you to skip forward to a certain task in the role. So it skips everything until that point and then continues running there. And that's really great for debugging. But if you uh, define a variable with set facts and you skip over it, that variable will just not be defined. So um, if you use, if you heavily use set facts, uh, that makes like prototyping really horrible. Um, Another point is that you can use ansible minus m setup and then the host name to check what variables are actually defined for a specific host. And everything set with set facts is just not there. So, yeah. Uh, in summary, uh, avoid the shell module, avoid the command module, avoid set facts as much as you can, and don't hide changes. Uh, with changed when. So the clean approach is always to use one task to check something and then a second task to actually execute something, for example. And also a bad idea, in my opinion, is uh, when people say, oh, well, uh, it's not important if this throws an error or not. I'll just say um, I failed when, fa failed when false. Uh, that might work sometimes, but um, the problem there is if something really breaks, you'll never find out. Advanced topics. So um, this is uh, about uh, the templating. So the usual approach, for example, for postfix role would be um, to do the following templating. You'd um, define certain variables in, for example, the group vi uh, group vars postfix servers. So any host in that group would inherit these variables. So this is sort of a list of um, parameters for SMTP recipient restrictions. And f uh, this is uh, just uh, the SMTP helo required. So the usual approach would be you define variables in the host vars or group vars or even in the defaults. And then you have a template where you just check every single variable if it exists. And if it exists, you actually sort of put the actual value there in place. So here I check if uh, this variable is set true. And if yes, I put the string there. Else I put the uh, this string there. And for example, SMTP recipient restrictions, I just iterate over this array and just output those values in order in, in that list. So um, the problem here is that every time uh, upstream defines a new variable, you'll end up having to touch the actual template file and touch the um, actual um, variables. So uh, I thought, well, um, you actually have 
keys and values and strings and arrays and hashes on the one side. And actually, a config file is nothing else than that, just in a different format. So um, I came up with um, the fact, well, the fact with Jinja 2 is you can also uh, define uh, functions. So I'll have to cut short a little bit on uh, explaining it, but Basically, up here, a uh, function is defined, uh, and it's called here in the bottom. And basically, what it just does, it iterates over the whole uh, dictionary defined here, postfix main. And it just goes, well, um, it iterates over all the keys and values, and it goes, oh, well, um, if the value is a string, I'll just put key equals a value. And if it's an array, I just iterate over it and put it there in the format that Postfix actually wants. And um, basically, you can do the same, for example, for HA proxy. And you can um, just deserialize all the variables you actually define. So um, the advantages of this is. Um, your template file just stays the same, and it doesn't get messy if you start adding things. Um, you have complete white space control. Usually, if you edit stuff, you kind of get an extra space, a uh, uh, new line in there, and that changes the template files for all machines. Uh, you have um, all the settings in alphabetical order, so if you actually run it and you see the diff, you don't end up having things going back and forth. And uh, if you get the syntax on the template file right, you don't have to touch it after that. And you also don't get any syntax errors uh, by editing that. Um, so um, that follows to the next one. Um, is you can actually set a hash behavior merge in um, the Ansible config. And that allows you to do the following. Um, on the left here, you define, for example, um, a dictionary. And uh, this is like in a group. And then in a specific machine, you define uh, other setting in this uh, dictionary. If you wouldn't use merge, uh, the second setting would just override the first one, and you'd end up with that. But if you actually do the merge, it does a deep merge of the hash. So the um, previous thing um, I showed would actually benefit from that. So the combination of both is, is really good. Um, then I'll skip that. Um, yeah, further resources. Um, Ansible has just a really good uh, documentation. Uh, check that there's uh, the ISC and there's also DevOps, which is a project that is um, specific to uh, Debian and derivatives. So, yeah, that's it. Thank you very much. <laughs>